Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Scholars at Risk Global Congress in partnership with the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and with the Freie Universität Berlin. My name is Sinead O'Gorman, and for those of you who are confused by the, the screen here, I am not a Scholar at Risk, but I am the European Director at Scholars at Risk, and I'm based in Ireland. As I walked over here this morning, I was thinking about the last time I spoke at this great institution. It was almost exactly five years ago, in March 2013, there was a light snow, and my meeting was with a decidedly smaller gathering of university representatives who were interested in forming a Scholars at Risk Germany section. There were only about 10 of us in the room that day, several of whom I know are with us here today. Although you were few in number, I was deeply struck that day by the determination I heard from the representatives in the room, the firm conviction that it was our collective responsibility to stand in solidarity with colleagues facing threats to their lives and their work, that German universities needed to do more, and that where there was a will, there was a way. And this same spirit has carried through to today with the inspiring leadership of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and in particular, through the Philipp Schwartz Initiative, its funders and partners, the German higher education institutions themselves. It is truly remarkable what you have together achieved. Your support for scholars, your commitment to academic freedom, is an inspiration to so many across Europe and beyond. And so we thank you again today for hosting the 2018 Congress and for welcoming the Global Scholars at Risk family to Berlin with open arms. Thank you. Now let me say a few words about today's program and just some practical announcements. We have a wonderfully rich program ahead of you today, I hope you agree. This morning's plenary session will run until about 9.40, 9.45 will address the challenges to safeguarding the world's scientific and cultural heritage, particularly in times of crisis. We will hear from a Syrian archaeologist about the research he is undertaking at the University of Heidelberg, and we will have keynote remarks from Dr. Marcus Hilgert of the Pergamon Museum. As you may have noted in the insert with your program, we have had a small number of changes to today's agenda, and Dr. Flavia Schlegel of UNESCO sends her regrets. She is unfortunately unable to be with us here this morning. So after the plenary session, we'll break into parallel sessions in lecture halls A, B, and C, where panels will focus on threats to scholars and universities in Egypt, Venezuela, India, and Pakistan, as well as some of the programs and initiatives that work to address these and other threats and challenges. In the afternoon, we'll have a plenary discussion on the case of the Central European University in Budapest, followed by sessions on academic freedom in Russia, Poland, and Belarus. And we'll also hear from several of SAR's partners on their practical support for scholars, their advocacy initiatives and capacity building programs. Then at the end of the afternoon, we'll have the Courage to Think Dialogues, featuring scholars from Serbia, the United States, and Iran. During the lunch break, we will invite you to visit the Activity Expo, which you have seen in the atrium. A number of our partners will have information tables set up there, and we invite you to go along and learn about their work. And in particular, I wanted to draw your attention to the poster presentation space in the gallery, featuring the research activities of academics assisted by scholars at risk, uh, the Philip Schwartz Initiative, and other partners. And tonight, of course, is one of the highlights of the Congress, our Courage to Think Award presentation and dinner at the DBB Forum in the center of Berlin. So if you have not yet registered for the dinner, I believe it's not too late to register, but you, do, you must do so in person at the registration desk today. So please let us know if you have any questions about that. Uh, the bus to the dinner venue will leave at 5.45 p.m. sharp from Gary Straza. We can, we'll repeat that in the afternoon, but it's basically outside. Um, I think that's it for the practical announcements, so let's begin. 
As Ulrike Albrecht mentioned during our opening plenary, the Congress celebrates the academic talent, social contributions, and courageous resilience of the scholars of the SAR network, our members and partners serve. Each plenary session begins with a short presentation by a scholar assisted by Scholars at Risk, the Philip Schwartz Initiative, or their partners. For this morning's session, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tarek Ahmed to present his work. Dr. Ahmad is an archaeologist from Syria. He holds a PhD in classical archaeology from Sapienza University in Rome and has worked on restoration and excavation projects across Syria and Italy. In Syria, Dr. Ahmad was a lecturer at Damascus University and active in the conservation of cultural heritage in Syria, including with the National Museum. He is currently hosted by the University of Heidelberg where his research focuses on the sacred landscape of Roman Lebanon. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ahmad to the stage. Dear professors, colleagues, and friends, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share my work during the scholarship of Philippe Schwarz Initiative. The goal of this short speech is not only to talk about my work experiences, but also to demonstrate what this scholarship can offer for an academic. The duration of Philippe Schwarz Initiative scholarship in two years seems to be short but it might be enough to restart recovering our academic career. As a young researcher, I tried to realize that on three parallel levels. The first consists of carrying out my main research project of my postdoc. The second aimed to publish the largest number of paper and book, while the third one plans to create a network attending conferences and meetings. The main research projects deal with the topic of sacred rural landscape in Roman Syria, studying the relationship between the rural temples and their landscape in northern Lebanon. Through some surveys conducted in that area, the scientific outputs will be published in several articles in international journals. Parallel to this research, Philip Schwarz Initiative allowed me to complete five other small researches and to translate a book into Arabic and to publish a monograph. The researches are written in Italian and English and Arabic. The first article in Italian and is published in the Italian Journal of Phoenician Studies, Rivista di Studi Finici, titled uh, The Rural Sanctuary in Syrian Phoenicia and its Development in Roman Period. It's a study on the foundation of rural temples and analysis of their architecture in early Roman period. The second article, it's also in Italian and, and now in press in the French journal Syria, titled Roman Fountain of the Sanctuary of uh, Zeus in Damascus. This contribution aimed to analyze the Roman uh, fountain discovered in 1974 in the old city of Damascus in order to formulate its reconstruction, dating, and uh, function into the uh, Roman sanctuary of um, Damascus. The third article is in English and now in review in the Journal of Asian History, titled Katukhoi of Paitukaike Hosun Suleiman. This paper elaborates the role of a group of persons called it Katukhoi in Greek within the economic, social, and religious context of the village of Paitukaike, modern Hosun Suleiman in Syria, and its Roman temple. The fourth article, it's also in English, and now in review in the conference proceeding of Bordening Horizons 5, titled The Roman Caravansarai Sanctuaries in Syria. 
This contribution aimed to emphasize the interaction between rural religious places and their landscape in order to trace the phenomenon of caravanserai temples in the Levant from their origin, but in particular during Roman times. The fifth article, it's in English, in review in the German magazine, Zeitschrift for Orient Archaeology, titled Roman Sanctuary in Kassernaus, Lebanon. This contribution presents a reassessment of arch architecture of rural temple at Kassernaus in Tripoli, in North Lebanon, during Roman period. This study is based on analysis of its structures with its sacred landscape and proposing a chronological arc of the site and its change over the time. Six is a translation from Italian into Arabic of the book written by Professor Giorgio Bocellati, titled From the Depth of Time, at the Origin of Communication and Community in Ancient Syria. In this book, the author illustrates the origin of our civilization through the site of Tal Muzan or Kish in Syria. The last and the most important it's a monograph in Italian recently published at Archipress in Oxford titled The Monumental Complex of Paitokakia Hassan Suleiman in Syria. It is an architectural, functional, and technological analysis of the Roman religious complex of Paitokak, based on uh, the 20, uh, sorry, 204 excavations and other uh, surveys on the site with a large epigraphic and numismatic collection, and with a new historical study of the Katukhoi complexes during Seleucid and Roman periods. This work researches would have not been achieved without the support of Philip Schwarz Initiative, and of course, Scholar at Risk Network and University of Heidelberg. So to conclude, let me uh, express my gratitude to Professor Thomas Maya sitting over there. I considered myself grateful and lucky to have him as mentor. Thank you for your listening. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad, for sharing your work with us. It's clear that you've been remarkably productive at Heidelberg and in a multitude of languages. Uh, I think your short presentation has really set the stage well for uh, our keynote speak speech by Dr. Marcus Hilgert. Dr. Hilgert will speak to us about the importance of cultural heritage and its study, not only for researchers and specialists, but for society at large. Given the extent to which cultural heritage is under threat in so many contemporary conflict zones around the world, these remarks promise to be very timely. Dr. Hilgert is director of the Ancient Near East Museum at the Pergamon Museum in Berlin and a specialist in ancient Near Eastern studies and cultural heritage research. I must add that for those of you who are in Berlin just for the Saar Congress and have not yet visited the Pergamon Museum, it's a must. Prior to taking up his current post, Dr. Hilgert was Chair for Ancient Near Eastern Studies at Heidelberg University from 2007 to 2014. In addition to his current post, Dr. Hilgert is Director of the Center for Digital Cultural Heritage in Museums at the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation and coordinates a national research alliance that focuses on the illicit traffic in cultural property in Germany. He serves on a number of governing bodies and advisory boards, and in December 2017, he was elected Secretary General of the Cultural Foundation of the German Federal States. If I'm not mistaken, your first term in this office will begin next week. Dr. Hilgert has spoken powerfully about the importance of cultural heritage, and in particular for societies in crisis, where cultural anchors of identity, of growth, and of hope are all the more vital. 
This morning, we will hear from Dr. Hilgert on how research and culture can contribute to social stability and sustainable development, especially in conflict zones. It is my honor to welcome our keynote speaker to the podium, Professor Dr. Marcus Hilgert. Thank you so much, Jeanette, for your kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased and honored to be here today. I would like to thank the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and the Scholars at Risk Network for inviting me to this very special conference, which is also a conference that's very dear to my heart, because as somebody who's devoted most of his life to the study of the archaeological heritage from Iraq and Syria, being here today, being with you, being with you, Ahmed, and your colleagues um, is a very special occasion for me. Now I need to figure out how this works. Okay. Exactly one week ago, on April 18th, Luca Yahir, the new president of the European Economic and Social Committee, delivered his inaugural speech and presented his vision for a sustainable European future. Referring to the top priorities of his agenda for a sustainable Europe, Yahir announced his intention to strengthen the role of culture within the European political discourse. According to Yahir, and I quote, culture has an enormous untapped potential to become a unifying and mobilizing force for Europe. In order to explain his reasons for this remarkable assessment, Yahir added, and I quote, we share a common European heritage composed of shared history and values, which allows us to sense our belonging to a joint space in constant evolution and openness to diversity. Culture can help us overcome the current systemic, political, and identity crisis in Europe and dare us to dream to create new perspectives. It can play a crucial role in strengthening social and territorial cohesion, in creating growth and jobs, in engaging in dialogue and in rebuilding trust. Culture can bring hope, new narratives, and a second renaissance to Europe." End quote. What an amazing statement. Usually, when we think of culture and cultural heritage, the first things that come to mind are not sustainable development, social and territorial cohesion, or the creation of economic growth. Rather, we tend to associate culture primarily with the visual arts, with literature and music, or with historical monuments and sites. In 1982, UNESCO coined a definition of culture in its Mexico City Declaration on Cultural Policies, understanding culture as, and I quote, the whole complex of distinctive, spiritual, material, intellectual, and emotional features that characterize a society or a social group. It includes not only the arts and letters, but also modes of life the fundamental rights of the human being, value systems, traditions, and beliefs." End quote. It is this more comprehensive concept of culture that has paved the way for a global phenomenon which I would like to call the cultural turn in politics. By that term, the cultural turn in politics, I refer to the fact that there is a growing awareness with various political and civil society stakeholder groups on national and international levels that the impact of cultural practice and cultural heritage reaches far beyond the realm of culture. In its 2005 Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, UNESCO emphasized that cultural diversity is a mainspring for sustainable development for communities, peoples, and nations, and that cultural diversity, flourishing within a framework of democracy, tolerance, social justice, and mutual respect between peoples and cultures, is indispensable for peace and security 
at the local, national, and international levels." End quote. Recent impact studies confirm that investing in culture produces tangible benefits also in the social, environmental, and economic sectors, thereby contributing significantly to the sustainable development and social cohesion of societies. Published in 2015, the final report of the EU-funded project Cultural Heritage Counts for Europe concludes that, and I quote, safeguarding cultural heritage works as a multiplier through which investment can have positive impacts beyond that initially intended, thereby increasing the level of benefit and sustainability of the initial investment. Moreover, potential future investment in cultural heritage from the mainstream policy stakeholders can be seen in terms of upstream investment, which has the potential to deliver significant downstream benefits. This can be seen in a comparison with often unplanned but beneficial impacts of upstream investment in preventive medicine, for example, healthier lifestyles, which reduce the downstream costs of treating illness and disease." End quote. Accordingly, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development of the United Nations aims at ensuring, and I quote, that all learners acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development, including, among others, through education for sustainable development and sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity and of culture's contribution to sustainable development. In the very same spirit, the 2016 EU Strategy for International Cultural Relations focuses, focuses on advancing cultural cooperation with partner countries across three main strands, supporting culture as an engine for sustainable social and economic development, promoting culture and intercultural dialogue for peaceful intercommunity relations, and reinforcing cooperation on cultural heritage. Finally, on March 24, 2017, culture and cultural heritage made it onto the stage of global security politics. When the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 2347, the first re resolution ever to focus exclusively on culture and cultural heritage, underlining that, and I quote, the unlawful destruction of cultural heritage and the looting and smuggling of cultural property in the event of armed conflicts, notably by terrorist groups, and the attempt to deny historical roots and cultural diversity in this context can fuel and exacerbate conflict and hamper post-conflict national reconciliation, thereby undermining the security, stability, governance, social, economic, and cultural development of affected states." End quote. Dear colleagues, as scholars, we're keenly aware of the fact that cultural practice, as well as its immaterial and material expressions, are invariably based on knowledge. Frequently, this knowledge directly derives from or is informed by research. At the same time, it is the immaterial and material expressions of cultural practice that may constitute additional evidence for existing research questions or trigger the formation of new academic fields. I tend to think that the close interdependence between culture on the one hand and research on the other is not acknowledged adequately in either sector, nor does it receive the political attention it deserves given the recent cultural turn in both domestic and foreign politics. However, there can be no doubt that research is indispensable not only for the creation and dissemination of numerous cultural products, but also for the documentation, analysis, preservation, and protection of material and immaterial cultural heritage. By definition, this research for culture is cross-sectoral and encompasses such diverse topics 
as the historical background of a novel, the painting techniques of contemporary artists, the scientific analysis of archaeological objects, the documentation of choreographies, the management of cultural heritage sites, or disaster risk assessment. Pertinent research designs may be disciplinary, interdisciplinary, or transdisciplinary, depending on the research question. With an increased political appreciation of culture as a facilitator of sustainable development and peaceful intercommunity relations, the demand for research for culture surges dramatically. Additional knowledge is needed desperately, not only with regard to material and immaterial expressions of cultural practice and their individual specifics, but also with a view to the inclusion of culture in social and economic policies, both on national and international levels. The effective transfer of culture into other core sectors of society and assessing the impact of this transfer will be among the key areas of research for culture in the near future. There can be no doubt that the cultural turn in politics and the research funding schemes inspired by it will offer tremendous opportunities for all academic disciplines ready to contribute to research for culture. However, it is also understood that fostering the multifaceted academic expertise necessary to carry out this cross-sectoral research is a highly complex task, even for economically successful societies in peaceful times. In the following, I will therefore outline four significant challenges to the progressive development of research for culture that I consider to be of high relevance and that I would like to see addressed by all concerned stakeholders with the required urgency. The first and most dangerous challenge to research for culture is any threat to the physical, academic, and moral integrity of scholars. Where scholars have to fear for their personal safety, where the fundamental principles of freedom of research are questioned, or where the code of ethical academic conduct is compromised, the welfare and future of a society as a whole are at stake. What research and culture have in common is that they cannot thrive without pluralism, diversity, and uninhibited creativity. Any attempt to undermine or curtail these distinctive capacities of the human spirit will invariably pave the way for social unrest, economic failure, and cultural poverty. Successful societies protect and promote their scholars in their quest for new knowledge. Those who do not pay attention to this age-old political truth will eventually have to pay a high price for their ignorance. The second determining factor for the future of research for culture and the cultural sector as a whole will be the way in which their exponents, as well as the institutions and infrastructures under their direction, are prepared to both embrace technological innovations, useful for research and teaching, and more importantly, become active players in the overarching process, which is commonly referred to as digital transformation. A process that will bring about major disruptions in the operation modes of most, if not all, areas of our everyday life. While at present the fourth industrial revolution usually termed Industry 4.0, is gaining considerable momentum in many countries of the world, digital transformation projects such as Culture 4.0 or Research 4.0 are still in their early phases and not pursued with the same tenacity by their respective stakeholders. However, there is no doubt that within the next two decades, the ways in which we design, carry out, document, communicate, disseminate, and store our research will change dramatically due to the wider availability and enhanced functionality of mobile devices, cloud services, digital applications, and the so-called Internet of Everything. In cultural heritage studies, for example, research and objects will increasingly become non-invasive and mobile 
through online repositories of three-dimensional digital object models, while exchange and interaction between scholars will be strengthened through social media tools tailored to the specific requirements of editing and annotating digital object models. The more precise and metrically accurate these object models are, the more useful they will be for the preventive documentation, conservation and restoration of monuments and museum collections. Moreover, augmented reality applications will revolutionize such diverse sectors as the management of collections and programs for inclusive education in museums. At the same time, the documentation and dissemination of immaterial heritage may benefit immensely from the opportunities provided by virtual reality applications. Finally, highly detailed digital models of landscapes and settlements will be used for simulations of complex situations and processes, enhancing our understanding of environmental and cultural dynamics in societies past and present. For the time being, Research for Culture 4.0 remains an ambitious vision for the digital future of our societies. Today, the implementation of this vision needs to be pursued with effective strategies, addressing various challenges such as harmonizing, synthesizing, and rendering sustainable the numerous digital data repositories created since the late 1980s, integrating research data relevant for the cultural sector into national and international strategies for the creation of long-term digital data infrastructures, and establishing digital research and teaching methods as an integral part of pertinent university curricula. Finally, we will have to aim at diminishing the digital divide existing not only between states on a global level, but also between cultural institutions on a national level. The benefits of the digital transformation of culture and research can only take effect when access to the pertinent expertise, technologies and infrastructures is as widespread and equally distributed as possible. The third type of challenge research for culture is facing today is one that may have the most profound impact on the credibility and thereby on the future of the pertinent academic disciplines. It is certainly a type of challenge that at present is felt by many to be the most palpable and the most pressing one. In essence, being a societal challenge, it is reflected in the question how research institutions and the academic community as a whole react to the massive humanitarian and cultural crises in several regions of the world and what role they choose to play in emergency response and post-conflict rehabilitation programs. In my opinion, experts in research for culture have a pronounced twofold responsibility to get actively involved in measures focusing on cultural heritage preservation and protection. One, the destruction and looting of archaeological sites museums, archives, and libraries immediately affects the core of countless academic disciplines as it damages, diminishes, and displaces their very research subjects. And two, protecting the material and immaterial heritage of humanity and creating environments in which this heritage can benefit local communities and foster cultural diversity cannot be achieved without the knowledge and experience of scholars as argued earlier. As crucial as it is to create the political frameworks in which cultural heritage protection can thrive, it is the scholars who are indispensable in national and international efforts to assess existing damages, carry out conservation and restoration measures, curb illicit trafficking in cultural property, build civil society capacity for the sustainable conservation and preservation of monuments and sites, develop international standards of engagement, and raise public awareness of the inherent value and social relevance of cultural heritage. However, scholars with expertise pertinent to research for culture are not necessarily specialists for fighting organized crime or for staging awareness-raising campaigns. Moreover, given the already sparse human and infrastructural capacities typical of many relevant disciplines and institutions, 
How can they provide the additional capacities that are required to design, assist in, or carry out the corresponding programs? I strongly believe that these considerable obstacles must not dishearten us, but should be seen and treated as a unique opportunity for the pertinent academic disciplines to expand their topical and methodological scope and to increase their social relevance and public visibility. This unique opportunity derives from the fact that protecting cultural heritage in situations of conflict and building capacities for a sustainable preservation of cultural heritage in times of peace are tasks for which many academic fields, not only in the humanities, possess a considerable inherent potential for the transfer into society of their research results and expertise. By doing so, the pertinent disciplines follow the distinct call by society and politics for an innovative kind of research that addresses overall societal challenges and therefore possesses a specific transformative power, a call that has been growing louder and more vigorous over the past decades in all areas of science and research. However, especially within the humanities, there is an ongoing heated debate whether this call for research activities oriented towards societal issues and favoring the transfer and application of research results is justified and in line with the treasured principle of freedom of research. My own thinking on this is very clear. As the global challenges to the sustainable development of humanity become more evident, as many regions of the world face the consequences of climate change, social inequality and violent extremism without adequate mitigation or protection mechanisms, publicly funded research must not close its eyes against these challenges, but attempt to develop ethical frameworks and research strategies enabling them to address these challenges not as a substitute for, but in addition to the basic research they have been carrying out traditionally. Considering the sustained large-scale threat to the integrity of the world's cultural heritage, the academic community is called upon to team up with non-academic experts and various stakeholder groups to design and carry out transdisciplinary research projects aiming at strategies, policies and instruments for the sustainable conservation and preservation of cultural heritage. These projects would be transdisciplinary in a twofold sense. One, their design invariably integrates academic and non-academic expertise and individuals to draw on the broadest possible knowledge base required to address complex societal challenges. And two, they contribute to the epistemological and methodological foundation of an emerging field of research where innovative project designs or unconventional combinations of expertise contribute to answering new research questions. Finally, let me highlight briefly the fourth type of challenge that Research for Culture is up against. This challenge is of a political nature as it concerns the actual ratio between the tasks to be fulfilled by the pertinent academic disciplines in the areas of research, teaching and transfer on the one hand, and the personal, financial and infrastructural resources that can be committed to these tasks by their professional exponents on the other hand. Frequently, research for culture is carried out by so-called rare disciplines or small disciplines, kleine Fächer in German, which means that the available resources are usually sparse, if not precarious, and that the concerned disciplines and the bodies of knowledge contained therein are prone to extinction or serious incapacitation when individual positions or facilities disappear. In addition, we can often observe distinct asymmetries on a global level in the availability and number of individuals and public institutions dedicated to research and teaching in these small academic fields like my own. It has always been a considerable challenge to drum up political support for academic fields that have virtually no potential to thrive outside of universities and other research institutions. 
Given the high number of students and the relatively low number of teachers in many of the more sought-after disciplines with a broader array of post-degree career opportunities, it does take very good arguments to convince the president of a university to invest in a field where the average class does not have more than 10 participants. In several countries, including Germany, this has led to intensified efforts to develop political concepts for monitoring and promoting rare and precarious disciplines on a national level. However, so far, there is no reasonable answer to the crucial question what the minimum infrastructural requirements might be to keep a rare or small academic discipline operational and innovative. In addition, existing global asymmetries within many precarious disciplines have not led to any palpable response on an international level. Ladies and gentlemen, if we agree that culture is the fabric of social cohesion and the rhythm of sustainable development, it is our common task to acknowledge these considerable challenges and deal with them in a constructive manner. Specific responses need to be given by both the academic community and by those who create and implement the policies governing research and culture. However, let us make no mistake, the more resilient research for culture turns out to be in the face of these challenges, and the more successful its exponents are in fighting off illiberalism while embracing rapidly advancing technologies and unforeseen sociopolitical processes, the stronger will be the political determination to sustain and promote the pertinent academic disciplines in the future. At the same time, the international community must step up its efforts to urge political leaders all over the world to make an unconditional commitment to the freedom of research to adhere to the principles of ethical academic conduct and to create an environment in which scholars like we, like you, may contribute to the advancement of humanity without having to fear for their lives or those of their loved ones. Without knowledge, there is no culture. Without culture, there is no society. Therefore, protecting scholars at risk and creating sustainable networks of experts for culture on a global level is not only a humanitarian obligation, but an indispensable investment in the future of our planet. Thank you very much.